Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first Boffin webinar of 2024. Uh, my name's Tom Allen Stevens. I lead the British On Farm Innovation Network, and we also lead Slimers. So that's strategies leading to improved management and enhanced resilience against slugs. So we're delighted to be working with UK Agritech Centre Crop Health and Protection, or CHAP, uh, with a small robot company uh, and with Harper Adams University, um, with Aggravation and with John Inner Centre on, uh, on this project. So I'm particularly excited with what we'll be discussing today and how we'll be training the robot AI uh, and how farmers can be involved in this. Uh, we're also going to get an insight into the world of nematodes. Uh, and in a moment, I'll be handing over to Kerry McDonald Howard from CHAP to tell us more uh, about this. But before I do, I just wanted to give you an update on Slimers and some of the other activity and projects that Boffin has been involved with on your behalf. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen. Bear with me a moment. Uh, so, firstly, um, the, the the NCS project, our project that's looking to grow more pulses and replace soya in livestock diets with homegrown pulses. Uh, we're on the lookout for pulse pioneers. We now have a draft protocol for the trials, and we're looking to undertake uh, that we're looking to undertake this year. So, anyone interested should get in touch, and we'll let you have uh, more details on this. So do look out for the for the Boffin Buzz as well, our regular podcast. The latest episode features Oxfordshire farmer Becky Berry, who's one of our slug sleuths. Uh, she talks about the monitoring that she's been undertaking this year and particularly the beetle monitoring uh, that she's been doing as well, as well as the importance to her of resilience, longevity and landscape. Now, we are delighted to be launching our new Project Truth this month. Uh, that's thriving roots underpinning total soil health. Now, I know that many of you will want to be involved in this one. We're working with the University of Nottingham with uh, John Inner Centre chat um, with Pez Technologies uh, as well, developing their novel sensor that smells the soil. Uh, so, um, and it can tell you a lot about the um, uh, the microbes and the life uh, within it as well. Um, so we're setting up a platform to explore soil and root health, and we'll shortly be looking for root rangers. So these are the farmers who will be at the heart of the project, um, and we'll be paying them to undertake measurements and trials in their wheat crop uh, as, as part of this project. Um, it's going to be a real insight into soil and root health. Give us some proper scientific data about what's going on beneath uh, the soil surface. Um, uh, so we'll have a webinar coming up next month. Uh, so do look out for this. Um, also, um, do, finally, do come along to the Low Carbon Agriculture Show at Stoneley Park in March. So we're planning a get together there and we'll be really keen uh, to see you. Um, and of course, there'll be extra project ambassador points for slug sleuths, pulse pioneers and root rangers who take the time to join us at the event um, and take part in the activities that we'll be putting on there. So look out for more on this. Um, and of course, uh, everyone attending this webinar, if you're a, a slug sleuth or a pulse pioneer uh, or about to become one, uh, then you will also get points for attending this webinar. Um, so how's it been going with, uh, with Slimers? Um, well, we now have 27 uh, slug sleuths appointed. You can see them across the country there. Um, uh, all the fields have been EC scanned or terra mapped. Uh, we've got about two and a half thousand slug refuge traps uh, that we've uh, deployed uh, around the, the, uh, the around the UK uh, uh, on our, on the sites that we're that we're um, monitoring or that our slug sleuths are monitoring. We're just now gathering in the data. Uh, most of the sites have now completed their autumn monitoring. We're just gathering in the data. Uh, we're going to be crunching that. Keith Walters at Harper Adams University will be looking at that. We're also getting in soil samples uh, from across the sites as well. Um, and we should have some results uh, later on in the spring to uh, to share with you. 
from the first year of monitoring. Has to be said, we've had some challenges with our monitoring. Um, a couple of sites, unfortunately, have had to be pulled because the crop just simply failed. Uh, it wasn't slugs. Uh, it's just uh, the, the season has been a very, very challenging one. Uh, we are hoping to re-establish those in the spring and have some uh, some spring uh, uh, trials, uh, uh, data from the spring trials as well, uh, which will um, hopefully build into the whole uh, into the whole data set and give us some uh, really good data to go on. I mean, there's, there's certainly been no shortage of slugs this year. I can I can tell you that much anyway. Um, so um, we've also uh, distributed a knowledge guide as well. Oh, with, um, now, this has brought together a lot of the the research behind this. Um, uh, it's distilled a lot of the, the findings that Keith Walters has looked into over the past uh, 10 or so years uh, into this area, and it's distilled it into a guide. It's been quite a job to actually get all of that knowledge into one guide, but it's a really useful insight into patch location forecasting um, and the behavior of slugs that there's this phenomenon of them gathering together in patches. Um, so I would advise, you know, if this is, um, if, if you're looking to get more precision control on your slugs, uh, it's a good guide uh, to get hold of. Uh, and it but does very much form the basis of a lot of the trial work that we're going to be that we're, we're doing at the moment uh, within Slimers and that we're going to be doing over the next two years as well. So it's available online and on our website, uh, also through the Farming Forum, um, uh, the, uh, the, the the new forum, the Slug Circle that we've got on the Farming Forum. Do get involved in that. There's plenty of uh, conversation going on on the Farming Forum now. We've got some really uh, interesting observances um, from our slugs lose. Thank you very much to those of you who have contributed uh, on there and shared your experiences. Do go on there and and, and talk. Uh, come on, you know if it, it, and anyone can join the slug circle um, and contribute on there. Ask ask for advice. We've got plenty of advice coming in from Keith Walters, from Clive Blacker, and from other um, uh, uh, experts involved in this project. Um, uh, that's where our discussion and uh, and where all the knowledge is being shared. So do come onto the Farming Forum. You can also download the guide from the Farming Forum uh, as well. Or if you'd like a um, uh, an actual paper version of that, we have got some available. Uh, come along to one of our events and we'll be more than happy uh, to give you one. So now we've also been gathering lots of uh, of slugs, uh, and uh, and I think uh, Kerry's going to give us a bit of an update on this in a minute. Um, but we had um, uh, the 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 press have been um, all over this uh, and have loved it. So I, I don't know, some of you may have seen the clips that we've had on Meridian and also on BBC News uh, about it. We've um, That's brought in a lot more uh, slug scouts as well, gardeners, allotment holders and schools as well uh, have been involved um, collecting slugs, sending them in um, for it. And this has really helped um uh doing the uh some of the, the the work that they've been doing at rothamstead and and i think kerry's going to be giving us a bit more of an insight uh into that as part of the project uh so fantastic that we've got so much involvement uh we've sent out i should think several hundred of these uh slug packs um now so um uh, and it's great to get uh lots of slugs coming in there's certainly as i say been no shortage of slugs this year that's for certain um so Anyway, in a moment, I'm going to be handing over to Kerry McDonald Howard, who's going to give us some more insights into that work. Uh, also, some more insights into slugs uh, and nematodes, um, and uh, the um, uh, uh, and so the, all the interesting behaviour uh, behind that. Uh, then we're going to be uh, hearing from Ray King, who is going to give us an update of where they've been getting with the Slugbot program um, and some of the um, uh, the robot. Um, elements of, of this. We'll be talking more about the, the field trials and what we're hoping to find out about the field trials uh, and learn from that. And then we'll open up for discussion and explore it a little bit more. And what I hope is that what we can do is bring you into that discussion. Um, uh, we very much want your your contributions into that. So um, do you'll probably see at the bottom of your screen a chat box and a QA. and a uh, So do put your questions in there, get the discussion underway, and then um, it'll be about nine o'clock shortly after. Uh, we'll open it up 
Um, and um, as I say, we'll try and get some of you involved uh, in the discussion, uh, bring you into the screen as well, if we can get the technology uh, to work. So it, um, if, if you're if you're up for that, I mean, obviously, if, if you don't want, uh, want, want us to see you, then keep your video switched off, but it would be great to bring some of you into the discussion. Uh, but we'll certainly do put your questions in there um, and, uh, and, and we'll, we'll talk them through. We want to have a really good chat about how uh, these field trials are going to take take place. Um, and then uh, I'll just briefly close it with some next steps. Uh, and then we're planning to close uh, the webinar at about 9.30. So without further ado, um, uh, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And I'm going to ask Kerry uh, uh, if you could join us. Uh, Kerry, if you'd like to, to switch your video on and come and join us. Brilliant. Hello. Lovely. Great. Well, I'll, I'll, thank you very much then, Kerry. I will hand over to you. Thank you. Right. Let me just get this on the go. So good morning. Yes, so I'm Kerry. Um, I'm the research associate uh, coming in to you from CHAP, uh, Crop Health and Protection. So a little bit about me first. I did my PhD on improving the efficacy of a biological control of slugs, Phasmorhabiditis hermaphrodita, the parasitic nematode of slugs. I'm sure quite a few have heard about this. So this just shares a few pictures from our PhD project. This is uh, Phasmorhabiditis hermaphrodita, but there's a few different Phasmorhabiditis species, um, for example, Californica and Neopolopta, um, that can also parasitize the slug. This picture over here is a lovely decomposing slug with loads of nematodes reproducing, because the, the, I'll go into the life cycle a little bit later, but they use the decomposing slug to actually use for their life cycle. And this little slug down here is a Durosaurus invaden, so closely related to the gray field slug that I'm sure all you farmers are aware of all over the fields. Um, and it's showing the normal signs of infection with the soil and mantle and actually the little tiny little shell coming out of it. All right, let's go on to the next one. So I'll go a little bit onto my PhD later and tell you a bit more about that later. But first, a little bit about my hobbies. As you can see, I have a strange one. These are the general pictures on my phone. I get excited every time I take my dog out for a walk at night. I find a different slug or locate the slug I've been tracking. Um, uh, here I've got two pictures of leopard slugs. They can get quite big. These leopard slugs are about uh, 15 centimeters long. And these ones in the pictures here, so they're quite large ones. This little one where it says shell, um, this is actually a Durosus reticulatum. But I got very excited the other night. I was out shining my torch and I realized that I don't have to dissect the show, uh, slug to actually see the tiny little shell that's still in the mantle. So one thing about slugs, just like snails, they once had shells and slowly evolved through the time. And now they only have this residual shell left, but it's actually under the uh, slug mantle, so we can't see it anymore. So the joke with the wife taking the house is not quite true. They just have a shitty small house. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> uh, right, next one. Right, so a little bit more about Phasmorhabiditis species the parasitic nematode of slugs. I've got a picture here of the three different life stages of um, the nematode um, to illustrate how the different sizes. So it starts, the smallest one there is about one millimeter. So you can just see it flickering if you're looking liquid and got very good eyesight. And at that stage, when it's the tiniest, that's when it's an, it's an infective stage. And when it has a bacteria source, it comes out of that stage, molts and grows into the next stage and starts feeding on the bacteria sources around, but actually isn't at an infective stage anymore. So it's very important that um, when we apply these nematodes, they're in the infective stage. And within my PhD, I took these nematodes and I um, used them in a number of ways of working out if abiotic factors may be impacting the ability of the nematode to infect and kill. And one of the things we looked at was soil types, which I know is quite close to the work that Harper Adams is doing with slugs. And it, it, it's quite interesting how we can see the different patterns with this as well. So with the nematodes, when put in three different temperatures, because they work at lower temperatures, um, just like slugs, they come out, they work better in cooler temperatures as slugs come out and not mostly and things. Um, um, and what we found is that in the more organ organic uh, composition soils, like garden soils or um, even compost, um, they, the, the nematodes would survive for a much longer period and actually increase in populations because they would feed on the bits of bacteria that are available. And in the, the higher the temperature was, 
the, the quicker their lifespan was, and uh, well, they just died out very quickly. And in topsoil or any fine soil with no organic matter, they, the, the, the population depleted very quickly over time. And just for fun, we'll have a show of a video of just a few nematodes. So those I grew in um, a assay in the actual lab. And that was in about three days and I just had mass loads of nematodes everywhere. So that's how I was culturing the nematodes in the lab. Right, so, so that's a little bit about my PhD. So why are we here today? We're looking into training for the AI system. And what we need from you guys and all the, all the different farmers and anybody else that can help is lots of imagery of um, the Durosus reticulatum, the gray field slug. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction into slugs themselves, because everyone needs that. Um, I have a bit of a diagram here of a general slug where we've got the head, the mantle, and the tail. And on the back ridge, there's what's referred to as the keel. Now, these can be quite long on some slugs, quite short, and some almost non existent on some of the slugs, but it helps with identification as well as the colorations. But colorations can be very variable in slugs. So it's the elements like the keel, um, the color of the sole, um, and the, the different, the, actually, the color of the eyes is quite a, and tentacles is one of the things that changes us quite a bit in that. Um, so I, use and love this book here um i don't want everyone to go out and bite but if you really <laughs> become obvious or really want to know what, what slugs have you've got where and which ones are more pestiverous and things like that this is quite a good guide and in fact i've got a picture here of the durosterus reticulatum part of the guide which is the slug that um, we are interested in getting all the imagery to train the ai currently as the first step um, it shows different color variation, it shows the different size, it even shows you the, uh, uh, the mucus color, because mucus of slugs can change and things. Uh, right, now a little bit more into Durosus reticulatum. I found this one the other night, well, found hundreds every night, but this one was uh, rolled around and made to be a model, so you could see the slug from all different um, angles. Um, so this is a very common look to the Durosus reticulatum, where it's got that mottled gray look and um, darker head and darker antenna and things. Uh, you can see that this one's a little bit bigger. It's five centimeters. So that's about the, the biggest you'll get a Doros reticulatum. Um, and, well, sometimes and when they've had a very good population base <laughs> and surviving very well in everyone's vegetation, they get a little bit bigger, but that's that's the average size on that one. Um, so, and also you can see the sole of the Doros reticulatum is quite an opaque sort of lighter color. Whereas if you roll over an area and like the big Spanish slugs, you'll see quite a yellow sort of sole. Uh, but these are a bit smaller. But these are the ones we need all the imagery for the when we develop, send out the rigs, we want the rostriticlum latum and every possible modeling um, figure shape and color variation. And when I say color variation, um, this is what I mean. So if you go out and you, you see these on the different plants or on the ground, we want to train the AI so it's not biased saying, oh, no, that's a slightly different color. That's not the slug we're looking for. Or, uh, no, that's a rock or um, it, that one's too bent over the leaf. So that's not a slug. That's why we need as many pictures as possible. So that's why we're going to be coming out with the rigs. And um, I, I will be working with you as well, times and things. And, and I will be collecting my own data at Rothamsted. And in fact, I'm working within the lab, collecting lab data, which is nowhere near as what <laughs> we need the real stuff really out there for the actual proper training right so um yeah so what we're going to do with this data I, th I think most of you know this but i'll just go for it there's uh, many of you don't uh, so, some of the you don't know um we need multi-spectral imaging um rgb and hyperspectral and uh, different images to train the AI model for our um, slug monitoring systems. So we can actually send the AI robots out in the end as a full system of actually being able to monitor where, when, and also use precision control. And this is where the nematodes come into it, where we're hoping to use precision control and apply the nematodes directly where the higher populations are as the AI finds them. Okay. so. That's that on the rigs and the developments of that I've got. And Ray's going to tell you a lot more about that with the actual rigs. Um, from an update of what I'm getting in, this, uh, in the lab from 
you guys at the moment, it, it's lots of fun every few days. We had to pause it over Christmas because I thought there was going to be a bunch of slugs stuck in the post office and in our offices and things. But this is basically what we get. We get the envelope, we get a box, and then we're like, what's in the box? Um, we are looking for mainly Dorosa reticulata, um, but it's actually interesting when we get all these others as well because I'm, I'm getting to see what different parts of the country have more of what certain type of slugs and that's another we're keeping all the data where they are coming from what type of slugs and then also the derosus reticulatum, and the gray field slug we are using um in experiments currently where i'm infecting with nematodes and seeing if they look different and different things like that um but that's another talk another time anyway thank you very much for your time and that's me done i'll hand you back to tom now thanks Great, thank you very much for that, Kerry. That what a fascinating insight into uh, in, into nematodes and so on. Um, so, uh, so many Latin names as well. Uh, uh, that's um, absolutely brilliant. Um, and uh, I do wonder about the, um, uh, <laughs> the the walks that you take in the evening uh, and uh, and the slugs that you come across. Um, fantastic, great. Let's hand straight over to Ray. Ray, would you like to join us? Turn your video on and your audio, and uh, and I think you've got a presentation for us. Fantastic. Uh, Ray, we can't hear you. There we go. You got, oh, Can you hear me okay now? That's that's better. Sorry, my uh, yeah, I'm not uh, not a regular Zoom user. Um, no, thank you very much, Tom. Um, so, uh, yes, so my name is Ray King and I am uh, the technical lead for the Slimers project at the, on, on, the, on, on behalf of um, Small Robot Company. Um, so I'm going to give you, give everyone a little bit of a rundown of kind of um, some of the kind of novel technology that we're, we're developing as part of this project. Um, a little bit of a touch on kind of our core product, um, our robot, um, and then kind of, again, flip back over and look at some of the um, novel equipment that we're going to be producing um, to facilitate some of the um, data capture as part of some building some of the models for this uh, for this project. So um, if I, here we go. So, Slimer, so, so uh, there's, there's a few um, sort of specific pieces of technology we're developing. So one of them is our autonomous robotic platform. We call that um, the latest version of that, TOM version four. Um, uh, as we kind of, it's already got a version, We bought it, it already exists, but um, the intention is to develop it further um, and, to, and to augment its capabilities. Um, so some of that is building in the capability for um, hyperspectral Im imagery capture. So at the moment, Tom V4 uh, uses um, RGB um, cameras, um, and that works incredibly well for what we do um, at present. So um, our, our current kind of core offering is around um, identification um, and location of weeds within fields. But um, we need to we need to um, uh, we need to kind of Take our take some of the features and capabilities and make them specific to um, the slug problem. Um, there's also going to be development of novel slug detection models. Um, we're we're not sort of directly doing that, but we're but we're um, heavily involved um, uh, within the consortium. Um, there's also the generation of multi-layer data sets. So so there's there's potential to build up um, date kind of data sets of. Um, RGB imagery, hyperspectral imagery, and soil sensor data that will help us to really understand what's going on um, within the field. Um, it, it, it kind of offers us the potential to unlock um, kind of um, kind of unlock things we, that, that might be unknown as to now in terms of um, uh, kind of soil soil type and 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 where slugs might be. And I know. Um, uh, uh, I know, Kerry, you, you sort of touched on that. So that could be some really, really useful and interesting data um, to get to kind of get um, kind of on a, on, a, on a large scale across a number of fields. Um, so some exciting opportunities there. Um, and then there is the creation of um, manual data collection equipment. So I'll go into a little bit more detail of that uh, in a couple of slides time. Um, so if I go to the next slide, so 
This is Tom, uh, version four. Um, so uh, Tom, Tom is a four-wheel drive, four-wheel steer, um, uh, or autonomous robots. It's got a, a electric drivetrain, and um, as I've said, it kind of the core of what what we do with this technology at the moment is we have that boom, which you can see in the image, um, that has eight cameras down facing, and basically we can run that across um wheat and barley crops and we can identify what's what's a crop what's a weed um and then uh we're starting to look at kind of looking at pressures on the on the crop so if there's any kind of uh visible damage on the crop the rgb imagery can can often um, detect that um and what we're what what we aim to do with this project is to is to is to build the features onto this robot develop the features onto this robot um, to open up the, the capabilities for um, slug detection at, at scale. Um, we do get often, quite often asked the question of, of kind of why robots, why not drones? Well, we with, with, with the robot, we get a, a much longer battery life uh, and the, the ability to, to, to cover um, kind of the highest possible area at the highest possible resolution. Um, we can operate in, in all weathers, um, and um, yeah, and, and we get that. Um, we get a uh, we get uh, what's what's the word? So it's called I think it's called a G, uh, GSD ground sample distance of 0 0.28 millimeters per pixel, um, which is is kind of unrivaled at the moment. I think some drones are starting to touch on it, but they can't cover a full field at, at that level. So. Um, uh, and then we sort of, there's other really nice aspects to the to the robot that we're looking to sort of investigate in the future. So it's a modular platform. We can we can kind of disassemble it and reassemble it into various uh, kind of capabilities. And and the long term view is to have the have the scouting is just the kind of kind of start of the of the operations, and then be able to actually put some actions, build some actions into these robots, so they can actually go out and. And, and kind of do something in the field. We've done a, no, a number of other um, Innovate UK funded projects, which I've been um, lucky to be involved in. And um, they've been looking at sort of um, spraying on a very, very small or, or very high resolution spraying. so a very small um, spray patch area. Um, so again, kind of looking to tap into the capabilities of, of, of the robotic platform. Um, and yeah, I think I think that's probably um, a good overview on Tom, and we've got a bit of time later. So if anyone's got any questions, I'm more than happy to talk you through. Um, so this is the this is the first step for us, or the first kind of big big work package for us uh, in the um, Slimers project. So we're working on a, a manual data collection rig. It sounds like a bit of a mouthful, but effectively it's a it's a camera with some wheels and a, and, a, and, some, and a handle so that a single person can go out into a field and start to capture data. Um, it's a really important part of the project is, is building up a really large body of data um, that allows um, that allows models to be generated so that we can we, we can get um, you know, really accurate detections of, of, of slugs in the field. Um, this kind of came off the back of the Slugbot project, which was um, an, an Innovate UK a uh, funded project from a number of years ago now that we were involved in. Um, and again, we were looking at, in, in that project, we were looking at sort of building out um, some detection capabilities and also some treatment capabilities. Um, and I think we we learned some of the limitations and one of them was we needed, um, one, of, one of the big limitations was with the data that we captured was we needed um, uh, more, uh, more variation in backgrounds for the slugs so that when we take the images, um, we can kind of, the, the, the model, um, the machine learning model can understand that's a slug against different types of backgrounds with so different crops, different soil types, um, different, potentially different lighting conditions. Um, and so this, these rigs are intended to, to be a, a kind of a fast and cheap way of getting out into the field and allowing farmers themselves to gather data uh, in their fields. So um, I kind of li listed out some of the some of the sort of capabilities um, of 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 the rig. So um, we have a, an RGB camera as standard. So that's that's pretty much taken from 
Tom version four, um, uh, that's a very much an, an understood and a known piece of technology. Um, we're also building in the capability for a hyperspectral camera. Um, the hyperspectral cameras are incredibly expensive. So we're, we're kind of, we're building that capability in, um, but allowing, uh, kind of allowing the rigs to kind of chop and change between cameras so that we don't have to have a full suite of um, hyperspectral cameras on each rig. Um, a little bit, um, it's potentially a little bit limiting, but it, it's 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 a it's, it's predominantly a financial limitation at the moment. Those cameras are very very good, but incredibly expensive. So it, it kind of gives us the ability to get two different types of data um, and and continue to build up that data set um, as we move forwards. Um, the the rig itself is is kind of a push push along design um, that's that that can be stopped um, in in a in a sort of a target area, we have a, um, a laser dot effectively, which will show the center of the image capture area. So when someone finds a slug, um, when they're out and about in the field, the laser dot will show the center of the uh, of the um, where the camera is looking. As soon as the image is captured, the laser dot will switch off and then it will, it will take an image, um, a, a clean image with no dot on it. Um, Again, it's all just trying to think about a kind of usability for 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 the people in the field gathering the um, gathering the data. Um, it's um, it's a it's a folding design. Again, we re we we really wanted this to be um, kind of easy to deploy, so we can just take it out the back of a pickup or out the back of a or or off the back of a quad or something, um, and very quickly go out and and gather, even if it's. 10, 15 minutes worth of data just so that we're building up those depth, those data sets as easy, easily as possible and quickly as possible. Um, again, kind of keeping along the ethos of, of, um, of, of not doing any damage in the field, keeping it low ground pressure. Um, we've built in capabilities around charging and kind of um, thinking about making sure the user can see that the that the rig is, is, is up to charge and ready to go. And again, um, we have some removable data storage. So uh, SSD drives effectively on the on on the rig, um, which can be removed and allow the data to then be pushed through the the relevant pipeline to 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 kind of channel it um, to towards markup so that um, human operators can mark up the imagery to help the machine learning uh, models to actually understand what is a slug, what isn't a slug, what does a slug look like. Um, so. As I said, this is kind of the this is the first step for us in this project. We were a little bit delayed starting, um, but I think I think we're making good progress. We're on track um, currently to be um, delivering these rigs um, early this year, so getting them into the hands of farmers. Um, and I think that's the next thing. So. One of the things we would like to know, and I'm I'm hopeful that there might be some feedback or some comments or some questions um, towards the end of this, but what are we missing and how can we improve these rigs? So um I don't I think I think when it comes to this, I think there's no such thing as a, as a, as a, as a as a silly question or a, or a daft question because we we think about things and you know we're kind of coming from the engineering side and the technology side, we think about things in potentially quite a different way. So to have a bit of farmer feedback to say this might not work, that might not work, or or have you thought about this or um, would be incredibly valuable for us, especially at this stage, because now's the time when we can we can make um, make changes and improvements. Um, and with that, I will finish my part of the presentation. And hand back to Tom. Great, thank you very much uh, for that, Ray. Um, uh, if you can, uh, you, can you unshare your screen? That's brilliant, wonderful, fantastic, great. Well, Ed, um, Ray, if you stay there, uh, uh, Kerry, would you like to join us? Um, again, um, fantastic. Um, so yeah, no, well, we've had uh, one, two questions uh, come through. Uh, 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 there's, there's one, I guess it's a point of clarification uh, more uh, than uh, a question. Um, hang on a sec, let me just find the question. Uh, from Franco uh, Della Casa, um, what crop is it? The crop in the manual data collection rig slide. Um, uh, I think this was in, in your presentation, uh, just asking what the crop was in that um, in that slide. Um, 
I think that was just a wheat crop. It was just a a, a yeah. fairly sta a, a standard um, kind of. I I pulled from our um, our sort of um, slide deck template. So that's just quite a nice picture with one of the. It's actually one of the older robots now in the background. Um, so yeah. that was. Um, I just wanted to try and <laughs> give it add a little bit of um, a little bit of something to the images rather than having very plain white backgrounds, which is what I normally deliver internally to the team. And um, so, yeah, that's just, I think that's just a wheat crop in the background. Yeah, just to clarify, um, uh, Franco, the uh, wheat is our target uh, crop. And in fact, that's quite a good, in, uh, that's quite an important point. Um, and uh, I guess with these rigs that we're going to be sending out into the field, um, uh, the, um, uh, we are looking to, to look in wheat crops, I think. Uh, is, is that right, Ray? Uh, yes, I think there was also mention of oil seed rate crops as well, um, but it's all very dependent on growth stage and yeah. the sort of the growth stage when the crop will be most susceptible. I think that was the conversations that we'd had at the last um, quarterly meeting, um, and I think that Jenna had mentioned as well, um, just around um, it's it's kind of. It, it, the 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 really the re, the most useful data is the when the crop is most susceptible, um, and understanding what the slugs are doing at that, that stage. Um, as the crop starts to get away from the slugs, then, um, it's 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 less useful, and also it's more difficult as a, a kind of an engineering and a technical challenge to deploy that into the field anyway. So, um, yeah. I think that's 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 the kind of the the Goldilocks, um. Point for us. Can I just add? Right. Um, yeah. we're, we're trying to align that the farmers are able to provide us with data with similar crop types at a similar time. So we can have a bigger data collection with more diverse, but the same sort of crop background. Mm -hmm. So with the dependence and what is growing at the beginning of this year is what it's going to be how are we going to choose the crops and things yeah i i guess i mean the, as you as you mentioned ray one of the limitations is is actually physically getting the rigs through the crop um mm -hmm. if you look at Aussie drake for example well it'll shortly be um uh too tall to go through mm -hmm. with a uh, with a rig so i guess we're looking at wheat and, and actually um uh, any early early sown crops they'll be getting too big as well uh i think we're, we're talking about sort of march uh when we're starting i think so it's mm -hmm. going to be um, um, probably more looking at spring sown or, or, or early uh, or late winter sown wheat um, that we'll be looking to focus on mostly. We are looking to focus on wheat, I think, rather than barley. Uh, I don't would would um I mean so if if someone collected some data in barley, for example, is that going to throw the the model out? Um, uh, you know, um, I don't know that... My I I would. It would probably be more of an issue with 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 when we've done things in the past with uh, weed models because you're looking at very similar things against each other. So you're kind of looking at uh, like the work we've done with black grass, for example, um, would probably it would probably throw that off because there's small differences, relative differences between black grass, wheat, and barley. If we're looking at slugs on a on a green background, I'm a, I'm imagining it's going to be a little bit more forgiving because a slug is very different to its background to a to a crop background. So, um, uh, I, I I wouldn't like to say for a hundred percent, but I would say it's probably not going to be a massive problem um, in right. terms of it's it's more about it's it kind of gets into a little bit of a machine learning kind of kind of concepts and how you structure those out but i don't think it would be a massive um a massive problem for us great uh we've, we've got loads of questions coming through uh in the in the q a um uh i was some um, uh david bullock shapcott uh thank you very much for joining us uh david um i was wondering whether we can uh uh, bring you into the conversation um sky if you're there i don't know whether you can um uh, see if we can make David a, a participant, if you'd like to be involved, uh, David. Um, ah, fantastic. Can we turn your audio on? Brilliant. Are you there, David? We can't hear you. So I'm here. Ah, we can't hear you. Yep, I'm here. Brilliant, David. Ah. Um, uh, lovely to... Um, can you hear me now? Yep, Brilliant, we can hear you. Thank um, you very much uh, lovely for joining to, us. Um, um, uh, 
Yeah. Uh, now, the, um, uh, I, I so, know that you've been in the uh, a long you time, David, uh, and, uh, and you put a, a question into the Q&A here. Uh, do you, do you want to just um, uh, uh, say what your question is? Yeah, my, my question is, do slugs give off any heat? And could they therefore be detected using infrared or, or heat detecting cameras? Uh, because if if they do, they would be possible to detect in their uh, kind of in, in environment when they're not active. In other words, when they're hiding in a rape stalker under a stone, they'd be able to be detected still. Uh, but if they don't, detecting them when they're not active will be quite difficult. Yeah. So yeah. So. Ooh. <laughs> <coughs> okay. um, Slugs do give off heat, but the, one of the there's many other insects that give off heat as well, as well as other um, organisms in the soil and things, as and also decomposing matter and things. So we we want to, and also slugs go underground when they're inactive. Slugs go underground, so it's a little bit more they're inactive. So it's a little, a little bit more difficult dead. to pick up that heat and things. So that's why the imagery uh, we've considered these different things, and why the imagery is what we're looking for for the actual concentrating on finding the slug populations. So, uh, by the way, sorry to mute you there, David, but um, we're getting quite a bit of feedback and echo um, uh, through you. So uh, uh, apologies for that. Um, has, has that, has that asked, answered your question? Yeah, that, that's fine. I, I suspected they did give, give off heat, and I recognise the issue of disappearing underground. I hadn't thought about the comparative with other things in the soil that give off heat. Certainly, from my point of view, the things that I see around in the winter are slugs and not much else. And, and therefore, I'd rather a, a, a kind of ruled out the other things. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, we want those images when we see them. So early in the morning or late at night and things when they actually come up and rise out of the soil and things. That's what we need for the AI training. Yeah, I was going to ask about that, actually, Kerry, because... Um... Uh, you you do all your slug spotting at night. Um, uh, yeah. Is that going to be a uh, a requirement that the so the guys who are going to have have the rigs? Um, well, uh, it, it, is that it, is it going to be necessary that they have to do do it in, uh, late at night or early in the morning? Well, I know farmers from growing up in South Africa with a father, <laughs> they're up all sorts of times, but um, it's <laughs> totally up to them. W one thing nice with Doros reticulatum, not only do they come out at night quite nicely in the masses, but they also um, quite often out in dusk and dawn when there's quite a bit of dew on the different crops and things. Um, that's when they're quite prevalent and around and about and come out the soil. So th that is generally up to the person we could do with imagery done in different light um, times and things as well so if when you see them take a picture but yes there's going to be I, I would like some at night as well great um uh, we've got a, a question come through from carol thank you very much for joining us uh carol the the um uh, about the camera angle of the of the rig is the camera angle on the rig affected by the height of the pusher um, my world is a foot shorter uh, than most, she says. Uh, so, um, uh, what's the um, uh, what, is, what, what's the score there, Ray? So, this is actually something we did think of. Um, originally, we thought about having effectively a, a just a two, a two wheel rig design, keep it really, really simple, um, just a single axle. But um, what we've what we've gone for in the end is a is a sort of a, a three wheel design, so two wheels at the front and a single wheel at the back. So as, as long as the user, um, as long as the user ensures that all three wheels are on the ground, then then the um, height of the camera should be unaffected and the angle of the camera should be unaffected. Um, we can certainly with the RGB cameras, we can accommodate a, a, a small. Um, Kind of deviation in the in the, in the height, the sort of focal length, um, with without any kind of issues in the imagery. Um, we've 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 got experience with that on the the robots themselves um, with a six with a six meter boom, so it's effectively three meters from the center of the vehicle. We do get quite a lot of height uh, variation. Um, but the the nice thing about the rig is the intention is for this project and and, and using and, and capturing slug data. Um, the user would um, roll up to the slug, find the slug, use the laser dot to make sure that the, the image is, is, is centered around um, that slug, capture the image, and, it, and at that, the time of capturing the image, as long as all three, all three wheels are on the ground, um, you're going to get a pretty decent image. Um, we, ha we have got some, we, 
we will of course have some testing to do to make sure that you know what what we've kind of designed and what we've and what we've produced meet those requirements but but um i'm i'm pretty confident in that um we've got a lot of experience with yeah putting cameras out in in in, in the field and making sure they do what they're supposed to do yeah i mean so the way i we uh, we think it's going to work, uh, don't we, Ray? Is that I think we've got five rigs, uh, isn't isn't that the case? And then um, um, what we're looking for is uh, it, it's not just going to go to five farmers. What we want is is for it to stay with a farmer for a week or two, um, and then move it from one farm to another. So perhaps we're looking for farms in uh, you know little uh, hubs, if you like, you know, sort of in in different regions of the country. Um, we we certainly want our slug sleuths to be involved, but um, but anyone uh, you know involved in the slug circle. Uh, I think the main requirement here is that you've got the right crop. It has to be a crop that we'll, you'll be able to, to to get through in March April time, which is when we're going to be doing the monitoring, uh, and that is going to restrict it. I think to um uh to uh, probably spring sown crops uh, or certainly late winter sown crops uh, anything that that's uh, above about i don't know what sort of 20 uh, centimeters once it starts into stem extension i think that's going to be too difficult for the for the rig to get through isn't that right ray yes i mean it's it's um yeah you can you can kind of see from the design there's a there's a there is an a, a effectively like an axle piece along the, a, along the front that's um that will kind of limit things. Um, the crop could be higher than that as long as the crop can withstand being pushed over and standing up again. The intention is that the the rig itself should be causing less damage than the person walking through the crop. Yeah. That's that is the current state of affairs with the the robot. Um, so the robot causes less damage than someone actually walking on the crop because um, the ground pressure is significantly lower um, than a human foot. Um, yeah. So, yeah, uh, we've we're getting loads of um, uh, questions coming through on the chat as well. Just um, uh, looking down here, how heavy? Uh, thank you very much to um, Andy for for putting this one in. Um, uh, how heavy will the manual rigs be, and on what kind of wheels or tires um, will they fit easily into the back of a pickup or a, a Land Rover? Yeah, so uh, back of a pickup or a Land Rover, the intention is that the, the rig will be um, able to fold or disassemble um, adequately to fit into the back of a, 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 yeah, a pickup, Land Rover, car, kind of something of that, you know, a car boot, that kind of something of that nature. Um, weight wise, um, kind of having an understanding of the materials and the components, I think we should be within about absolute max 20 kilos and I, I would hope it to be significantly less than that until we weigh the the, the kind of the final um assembly it's a bit of a little bit of an unknown um but we're we're, we're, we're aiming to keep within that so it should be within the sort of annual handling limits um uh wheels and tires will be um the front wheels are sort of uh pneumatic small relatively small pneumatic um uh, wheels and tires and then I think well, it's similar to the ones that are on the on the version four do you think uh they're not as big as that they are those are um those are considerably bigger I, you know they're sort of three four hundred millimeters diameter oh, right. and, and probably yeah 200 millimeters wide very roughly these are going to be sort of a an order of magnitude smaller but the rig itself is smaller and it's a yeah it's just a push along um uh rig yeah, I see. And I, I, what's the, how are we envisaging it? It's going to work. Is is it a case of um, uh, someone from Small Robots turning up on the farm with the rig, um, giving a little bit of instruction to the farmer, um, and then uh, away they go, kind of thing? Um, the our our understanding of it is that um, we will create the the sort of the the training documentation and train kind of whoever is required. It could be on farm training i think we we probably prefer to just get every, everybody that's that's going to be using the rigs together and and kind of at one at one point in time and saying this is how you do it here's the kind of um here's the the manual here's the documentation that, that will support that um and it could be that we train other consortium members to be able to train people if that makes sense so we could say right okay we we'll, We'll get a few people from chap and they may be delivering some of those rigs out to people so we'll show you how to train people the 
the the the uh um the um the rigs yeah the rigs are intended to be as simple as possible and as easy to use as possible um but as I've said, this is this is why this is really important to have this conversation because we, mm-hmm. as an engineer, we might think it's 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 simple and 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 straightforward, but we have some prior knowledge and we've designed the system, so we're going to have persuaded ourselves. So we need that feedback to say actually this doesn't quite feel right. Um, the the training documentation and the training um, kind of process won't be developed by the engineering team will be developed by the service team who are used to taking the robots out into the field so that is a really good point at which we can hand over and say you guys don't have any prior knowledge of the technology but you you guys go you you guys can structure out how how that's done um, and those guys are really really good at that they're very good at doing the training um right. and, and and they've done it for the robots um when we saw we've we've sold the robots um to the Robotarium and um, James Hutton Institute, um, and we did um, they did all of the training for that. So this is a significantly less complex system. So I'm hopeful that, yeah. So uh, well, uh, perhaps if there might be a, a kind of hub farmer, if you like, who um, uh, um, is, is given proper training and would be able to train others in, in doing it. And it would be the hub farmer who would look after it and then um, uh, you know use it for a week or two and then take it to another farmer Show them how to use yes, it. Yes, yeah, yeah. For a couple of weeks, then pick it up I, and take I it to another farmer. Would it? Would that be the some, certainly way it would work? Yeah, I must be trained up. Uh, okay, yeah. uh, Kerry's trained up as well. And I, I'm, I'm going to be trained up and sent around yeah. to the farms as well, just for an oh, extra where, bonus. Where are you, Kerry? I'm based in Harperden, but I also live up in um, Hebden Bridge in uh, Yorkshire. So. <laughs> uh-huh. I go up and down. <laughs> and, uh, talking of Yorkshire, we've got a question that's come through from uh, Graham oh, yeah. Potter. Thanks for joining us, uh, Graham. Um, talking about we need to be eradicating slugs before we sow the spring crops. So if the stubble is bare with no green, it could be hard spotting slugs. I mean, that is a point here. Um, but of course, this is going to be reliant on actually finding slugs in the field with the rig. Uh, I mean, just ha- and, and this relates to another question that Jonathan Trotter has put in again. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for um, for joining us. Um, uh, how many slugs are you hoping to capture with the rig on a farmer basis and an overall project basis? We we I mean you know we, we keep talking about gathering all these images of slugs. What happens if the rigs go out there and we don't find any slugs? Is <laughs> is it going to be um, a slug damage that we're looking for as well? So okay. uh, I'm working on both in the lab at the moment. And um, so that is one thing we'll be looking at later on using the rigs, possibly later in the year with slug damage and doing a retake of it and looking at slug damage. But initially the slugs and by the looks of it, the slug population this year has not depleted because it just hasn't been cold. You're going to be hard hit with slugs this year. And I'm seeing loads out there already. Um, I'll be yeah. surprised if we don't get images of slugs because they're out there. Um, but uh, uh, eradicate, we still do the controls and everything. We want what's normally out there and the normal images and everything else. And when we want to say how many, <laughs> thousands, um, <laughs> but <laughs> as many as possible, as much as you want to get out there and do it. Um, I will also be using one rig and using it in Rothamsted and going out as much as possible because we've got the different fields there with the different crops. So I'm utilizing that as well. Um, I know that some nights you go out and there's absolutely nothing because the weather's just a degree out or just not the right, um, not enough moisture in there or something, or it's raining too hard. So there will be nuts or days that you go out and there'll be nothing out there. You go out the next day and there's thousands around you. It, yeah. it's, it's the luck of the draw, but yeah, um, we we'll, we need loads of images. So as much as possible from both farms. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, now we've got a question that's come through from Clive Blacker, Clive uh, from Aggravation, one of the project partners. Thank you very much for joining us, Clive. Um, is the manual camera rig uh, working with its own light source or will it only work properly in ambient light? That's a good question. It has, uh, yeah, it will have a light source. Um, <clears throat> again, the RGB um, light source will be the one that we've carried over from the robot. So a very understood um, lighting source um, for us. Um, and then the hyperspectral will sort of the, the intention is that the, the hyperspectral camera will kind of will, will kind of float around between the rigs um, to allow us to get that um, diversity of data set, um, and that has to have its own specific light source because of the the, the kind of the the spectrum of the light 
that it's looking at. Um, <clears throat> but mm. um, yeah, we will. We're, we're, the intention is we'll kind of make that up into its own. But on piece with it, it's just going to be plug and play. So potentially unbolt the RGB bolt on the hyperspectral, um, and then off we go. And it will the, the the signals and the power sources will all be the same. So it should just be a case of right. Okay, I'm doing exactly what I was doing uh with the rgb but it's now a it's now capturing a different type of imagery the height uh has to change because of the change in the the, the lens and and, and and kind of that side of things but yeah the it, they will both have their own light source so the intention my understanding was um uh was that the that most of this most of this work will probably be done at night when the slugs are most active but right. um but I'm kind of from from the rig and the technology perspective, it's kind of it it, it could be ambivalent. We could we could go in the daytime. Um, I, 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 I guess it's also going to depend slightly on the time of year. I mean, um, where are you at with the with the rigs, by the way? So whenabouts do we do we think we're going to be ready to actually deploy the rigs? Uh, we're still on track at the moment. I can't remember what, exactly what the um, it was. It was March time, wasn't it? I think it was beginning of March. Yeah, yeah. So um, we we got a little bit delayed by some uh, suppliers and some some stuff coming in, but we've been making good progress with um, the sort of prototype um, system with regards to the electronics and the software. So once that's nailed down, it's just a kind of a case of press go and um, order the order up the batches to make up to a uh, like four more effectively, so that we've got the five rigs worth. Um, the kind of the main mechanical chassis itself is largely off the shelf part so it should all be fairly quick but we did get held up a little bit before christmas um but yeah we should be on we should be on track as far as i'm uh, yeah aware of uh, another question's come through from carol about um uh, are we going to do a training webinar or zoom call um the, uh, and yes the answer is uh, i think the, the most likely it would be a video uh, so we'll produce a, a training video uh, as well as actually do do some uh, as 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 we mentioned earlier some in person training. Um, uh, obviously, you know that's going to be sort of slightly uh, dependent on actually getting the right staff in the right place and the right farmers in the right place. So we will be doing a video uh, as well um, mm -hmm. to make sure that everyone uh, knows what's what's being done. And I think what we're looking at so we're looking at the beginning of sort of um, March to start with and going on until the slug activity slows down. I, I guess wouldn't that be right, Kerry? Yeah, well, I'm actually looking, um, I would like to go and meet whoever is volunteering for this um, uh, during February, hopefully somewhere along the line in the middle of February, right. maybe. So I just get the initial meeting, learn about the different crops, what they've got going, what they're expecting and what advice and things like that. And then I can take that back and then we can do the training and then get it going March, April, probably get the rigs out there and get as much data as probably possible. Yeah, and, and as far as some, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, this will be a trial where the the, the slug slews who are taking part um, will be paid um, oh, for yes. their activity. <laughs> um, uh, and we haven't yet worked out exactly what the payment will be and how it will work. Um, perhaps we might have uh, sort of an extra um, uh, bonus element, uh, the more slugs you get or something like that, I don't know, <laughs> um, uh, the more slug picks you get. Um, uh, that's yet to be refined. Um, but obviously, you know, we'll work with you to um, uh, make sure that, uh, you know, you're, you're adequately compensated for your time uh, and um, uh, an involvement with the project. Um, so, uh, but look, we're, we're nearly out of time um, uh, on this. Uh, I'm just looking down to see whether there's any other questions that we haven't uh, uh, covered. It looks as though um, most, of, thank you very much everybody who's who's contributed. Uh, <laughs> one pound a slug is what Graham, Graham Potter uh, suggests. Uh, I, I'd, I'd hope that it would be more of a, um, what I'm sort of thinking is some, somewhere along the, uh, the lines of um, uh, a thousand pounds per user for, um, uh, for, for doing it. And then uh, perhaps a bonus for, um, you know, for those who get uh, more than a certain number of slugs or something like that. Uh, so let's, um, uh, let's see where we get. <laughs> Maybe you can use one slug in different angles. <laughs> the suggestion from David Fuller Shack got that if it was a pound of slug, he could retire on that rate. Uh, so you've always got a lot of slugs up there, David. Okay, brilliant. Listen, um, I'm going to wrap up now. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you very much for the, all the um, uh, for all the comments and all the questions. Thank you especially to Kerry uh, and to Ray 
Oh, oh, hang on a second. We've got another one uh, that's come through. Uh, uh, um, uh, no, that's just a networking question. Um, uh, so thank you very much to to Kerry and to Ray. Um, we will get some uh, some more details about this uh, out to you. Um, uh, but in the meantime, if you're interested in taking part, um, do get in touch with myself or with Sky um, through the usual channels. Um, uh, and um, uh, let us know that you're that, that you're interested, um, uh, and um, uh, we will be looking shortly to to try and find our farmers. And as I say, what we're what we're looking to do is to is to have some sort of pubs around the country, um, uh, and so uh, and looking to get to sort of gather people in groups, if if you like. Um, so do get in touch if you're interested in being involved in this trial, um, uh, and uh, we'll take things forward from there. So, um, but anyway, listen. Thank you very much. Um, for joining us this morning. Um, have a have a great rest of your day uh, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you very much yes, thanks. and goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <clears throat>